Hi class, welcome to Advantage. I'm Dr. Jody Richardson Delgado. We're gonna be talking about abnormal psychology for Psych 101. So let's talk about the definition of abnormal or abnormal psychology. This includes a mental process and or behavior problems that cause emotional distress and or substantial impairment in functioning. So we have four criteria that we use when we are kind of figuring out if someone has this substantial impairment in functioning or if there's some kind of problem that this is causing for them or those around them. So statistical infrequency is when we're looking at someone's behavior or thought process that is not frequent. So believing that others are plotting against me or others are plotting against this person that we are evaluating is not something that we typically hear about or people complain about. Um, we might hear someone talk about how someone is viewing them through a computer or viewing them through uh, different parts of their home when in fact no one actually is doing that. That's not something that we frequently hear about. The next criteria is disability or dysfunction. So we look at this mental process and behavior in terms of how it impacts the person's life. Is this causing some type of distress for this person or is it causing some kind of disability for them? Are they able to show up for work on time regularly as required? Are they able to go to class on time regularly as required? If they're not, then what is the pattern? What might be happening with their mental process or behavior? Is something impacting that? This could be due to substance abuse like alcohol. So if they're showing up to work inebriated or they're not able to go to work because they um, drink and this is happening frequently, now we are looking at a disability or dysfunction. Another issue is personal distress. That's another criteria that we look at. If someone is having personal distress because of their symptoms, because of their behavior or mental process, this then is another criteria that we use. An example might be someone is feeling intense sadness and or having suicidal thoughts. And this is enough in and of itself to get treatment for that individual. Another thing that we look for is a violation of norms. So we have norms in our societies that we live in, and the norms that we look at in this class would be for that of the Western world, uh, the United States. Is this person's behavior and or mental process fitting in with the norms of our society? An example of this might be going out and shouting at strangers. This isn't something that we typically do, and so we would see this as an abnormal behavior, and if this is happening frequently, then we would look at this and it would fit the criteria of abnormal behavior. Some of the other things that uh, we look at in abnormal psychology is the history. And it's important to note the history of abnormal behavior. Abnormal behavior has been recorded and looked at since the beginning of man. We have been able to look at some of the prehistoric records and uh, skulls that we have dug up and we see that holes have been born in, bored into them. We believe that that is uh, to allow for the evil spirits to be released from the individual. And that was the most common treatment for mental disorders up until recently. Exorcism, um, trying to release the demons from the individual to relieve them of their pain from their mental process to kind of help them um, in terms of be able to be in society with one another. So another thing that we have used um, is asylums. And in the beginning, these were set up to be a humane treatment. And unfortunately, it didn't end up that way. So we put people in asylums as a way to try to rehabilitate them at first. And unfortunately, over time, over a short period of time, they really became warehouses for people who really did not fit the norms of society. Um, and people were treated very inhumanely. Um, at times, people were put in solitary confinement. And we know now that solitary confinement in and of itself is enough for an individual to really have symptoms of some of the mental disorders that we'll talk about later in the videos. So we do not have a positive, healthy history of treating people with mental disorders well. 
we are trying to change that and it was in about 1955 when medication was introduced that we were able to start treating some of the biological causes of mental health disorders. Please understand that when it comes to abnormal psychology and the way that we are addressing it in this class, as well as many classes, we come from a Western medical model. There are many models of abnormal psychology, but the Western medical model is the one that we go from with the American Psychiatric Association, as well as the American Psychological Association. So many of the terms that we are talking about come from a psychiatry background. The DSM is the Diagnostic Statistical Manual. This is the book that we use in psychology and psychiatry to diagnose and help with treatment for individuals who have many of the disorders that we will talk about. Uh, the first DSM was published in 1952 and there have been many revisions to this book over the years. Up till now we have the DSM-5 and that was published in 2013. It didn't start to be widely used in the medical community until about um, 2015 and even now today if you go back into um, old records or someone comes into the hospital that was uh, diagnosed before 2015 you'll see diagnoses and terminology from the DSM-4. I'll talk about some of the differences between the DSM-4 and the DSM-5 as we go through some of the different diagnoses and treatments. There are many criticisms and limitations of the DSM-5 and abnormal psychology. There is a problem of overdiagnosing. We've heard that about many of the disorders that are in the DSM-5. People are overdiagnosed overtreated with uh, medications or, and or therapy. There also seems to be a cultural bias, especially when we looked at that fourth criteria of cultural norms. Um, we've seen that throughout history where people don't fit the cultural norm, so there is a bias against that. This is one of the reasons why we have four criteria instead of just one. We have those four criteria so that we can look in four, four places instead of just one. We also have problems with labels. When we label an individual, then often they will get put into a box. And this is a problem for them if they share that label with others who may have a stigma against maybe their diagnosis of depression or anxiety. So in the next videos, we're going to talk about some of the different disorders that are in the DSM-5. I hope this video has helped. Thanks for watching. Please click on the Advantage logo to subscribe.